So David, welcome to the podcast. It's really great to have you here. Um, as uh, an introduction to our audience, perhaps you could tell us a bit about your background. I will. Thank you very much for inviting me, Will. I'm delighted to be here. Um, well, my background, uh, well, many, many decades ago, um, I graduated as an electrical engineer, and then I went into software engineering, actually before it was actually called software engineering, so it gives you some idea of how long ago that was. Um, and I've worked in industry, I've worked in academia, and for the last 25 plus years in consulting. And, um, and 11 years ago, I formed a small uh, advisory firm called Fermisio that focuses on strategy and change. And that's really what I've been focusing on over the last 20 years or so, is how can we get better at developing and executing strategy, um, particularly strategies that are enabled by digital technology. Because when I started in this field many, many years ago, we used to dream about the things we could do with digital technology. Now we can actually do it. Fantastic. And I'm really and I know you're a well known speaker. I mean, you've spoken on many a stage. I think where we first met, you were speaking main stage at some conference. And uh, you're perhaps best known for the book you've recently published, which I want to talk about called Beyond Default. Before I do, don't want to date you too much. But you said you started off as a software engineer before it was even software engineering. You just share with the audience some of the software languages you're using back then. Do you remember? Uh Oh, it was um, PL1 was my basic, of course. There was another one which I can't remember, but I cut my teeth on PL1 on the old big IBM mainframe machines. And actually, a lot of the work that I was doing then, actually, I can say that I wrote my first computer program in 1969. Okay. So it took a long while to write, and it didn't do very much when it finished. Very good. Well, there we go. And I think maybe that's the way some of us in this business get to identify themselves. For what it's worth, my first languages were basic Fortran and Pascal. So that was uh, a little bit after 1969. But uh, I'm yeah. not sure what the what the cool kids of today are identifying as their language. But David, let's talk about the book. So back in 2017, you published along with your co-author, Peter Boggus, a very successful book called, go, called Beyond Default. Can you... Um, just sort of give us the broad brushstrokes of the genesis of that book. What caused you to, to write that? Well, I suppose the trigger was more that we were approached by a publisher who'd read some of our material on our website. Uh, and they thought it would be a good idea if we could um, uh, embellish it, give these ideas a structure and create a, a, a book. And um, it's something we'd never actually considered doing. Uh, but when we thought about it, um, we thought, Yes, let's, let's, let's try and capture what we've learned over the many years and put it in the form of a book. And, and really, it was very easy to, to lock into the idea because for many years, we, we've, we've asked ourselves a question. Why is it that some organizations are more successful than others? Is there a reason for this? I mean, why is it that some great companies like, you know, like Blockbuster, Borders, uh, Air Berlin, uh, Marconi, uh, and no longer exists. They, they, they've gone. And, and, and other um, organizations, extremely well-known organizations, are a shadow of their former selves. Xerox, Kodak, Yahoo, Blackberry, uh, Toshiba. And there are other organizations like GE that are struggling. Um, and, and there are some organizations that continue to go strength from strength to strength. Apple, Meta, of course, now. Uh, IBM, Netflix, Amazon, Disney, they're going from strength to strength. And there are um, multi-billion dollar organizations that exist, that exist now, but didn't 10 years ago. So you take the Hoobers, the Airbnb, Spotify, Tesla, of course. So why is it? What is it about these organizations where some of them are more successful than others? And is there something fundamental going on? And, and, and one of the conclusions we drew was that leaders of these organizations have less control over their destiny than they think they have, right? So there's some things going on that shape their destiny and the trajectory that they're following. And that's really one of the core ideas uh, that we explore in the book. So, and I know you're known, um, David, for having um, not necessarily controversial, but fresh and innovative views. I'm not gonna open up the book and find values, vision, mission, 
KPIs, OKRs, and all that sort of standard meat and potato stuff when it comes to strategy. I, I know I knew I wouldn't have find that if we opened up the book. Can you give us, you know, what, what, are, the, what are the big ideas that you, 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 you present um, in, in the book? Well, before I go on to that, one of the reasons we don't pursue that is that those ideas about having KPIs, visions, missions, and so on and so forth and values have been around probably for 30 years. And if you, if you research how successful organizations are at strategy and change, it's not really improved over the last 30 years or so. Let me just quote a couple of, of studies for you, if I may. There was one in 2013 where over 2,200 executives uh, were interviewed and 44% of those who responded um, found themselves in a situation where they didn't understand the strategy they were expected to implement. And 38% and of those didn't agree with it anyway. So if people don't understand the strategy they're expected to, to implement, it's unlikely to be successful. And, and there's another one in 2017 by the Economist Intelligent Unit of um, 500 senior executives from companies with annual revenues over a billion dollars. And 90% of respondents failed to reach all their strategic goals. That's nine out of 10 organizations. 59% admitted that the organizations often struggle to bridge the gap between strategy development and strategy execution. And 20% failed to meet their strategic objectives because of poor implementation. And the one I really like is one in 10 of these organizations Failure in strategy had no impact on them achieving their financial goals. So we didn't need a strategy anyway, right? Now, over the last couple of years, for obvious reasons, there's not been much research done in this field. So, the, so I think the, the traditional way of thinking about strategy is delivering what everybody expects. And, and our view is, that one of the reasons for this is that a lot of leaders don't recognize but their organizations have what we call a default future. It's the place they will end up if they take no action other than currently planned. Okay, so if you just cruised along, that's where you would end up. And, and we believe it's the responsibility of leaders. They have an obligation to understand what that default future is. And if it's not acceptable, confront it confronted by putting their organization on a trajectory to a different, improved future. So for us, the essence of strategy is changing the trajectory of the organization from one that's taking it to its default future to one that takes it to an improved future. Right. That's, the, that's the essential purpose of strategy. So, um... How do we do this? I mean, I, I get the idea that we've got, you know, left unchecked, all things, current course and speed, we're going to end up in some default future. I'm almost, because I want to connect this to enterprise architecture and digital architecture, I'm almost thinking of classic current state, future state architectures, right? Left unchecked, this is where you're going to do it. So now we have to change the trajectory, as you say, to go to this alternate future state. So yeah. if it's not KPIs and values and vision and mission statements, how are leaders to go about changing the trajectory? I guess that's the secret source. How do we understand, I guess, first of all, what that default future looks like? And then how do we change, I guess, our destiny as, a, as an enterprise? Well, I think you've touched on the first thing. You, you, you need to understand what your default future might be, right? Now, we're not saying you need to predict the future, but what we can do is we can have an understanding as to what that default future might be by looking at the, the forces that are keeping you on the trajectory that you are on. And there are two types of forces. One we call exogenous forces. These exogenous forces are those that originate from outside the organization. You cannot control these exogenous forces. You can only respond to them. So for, for example, regulation is an exogenous 
force. Yeah? Technology development, of course, is an exogenous force. What your competitors are doing is an exogenous force. And, and two we've been experiencing recently, one is a pandemic. That was an exogenous force. Yeah? And of course, the war in Ukraine at the moment is an exogenous force. So, so, I'm, so I'm thinking of, a, I just want to bring like a real company name to it. So I, when you're saying these exogenous forces, coming to mind, of course, is, is Blockbuster, is Kodak, you know, these exogenous technology driven forces that were, that were affecting them. Do you have any, I know you've got lots of examples of the book, do you have any, like a, a brand name that our audience can connect with that talks about? Well, you, you mentioned one, Blockbuster, which we, which we feature in, in, in the book, and, and, and that's one where there was a, a, a exogenous force that first of all um, created opportunity for Blockbuster, right? Uh, and, and, and that is the, uh, the studios were making films available uh, to, to, to public use before, uh, not later than, than in the cinema. And, and equally as well, the standardization of the old VHS format tapes, you remember, remember yeah. those, right? Uh, and, and also in terms of database technology, because it enabled them to actually identify what type of films people were watching and what and recommend other um, films they might want to watch. So Blockbuster really grew rapidly as a result of these exogenous forces. Then there was another exogenous force that came along that completely and absolutely changed the context within which they operated. And that, of course, was broadband. Yeah. It was the internet. It was streaming. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and so and the, the tragedy then was that Blockbuster was just not able to respond. At one point, um, Netflix tried to sell itself to Blockbuster. Would you believe? Wow, I did yeah. not know that. So, yes, the point we're making here is exogenous forces can open up opportunity for you. Yeah. Yeah. But equally, it can close down opportunities for you. I got it. So, so that, we've, got, we've got exogenous forces, and you, I, I didn't realize that uh, Netflix tried to sell themselves to Blockbuster. That's fascinating. Boy, I if, you, that's... if you read, if there's a book on the, the, the success story of, uh, of, of Netflix, and it, 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 in there, there's a, there's, there's a chapter on the, the meeting they had with, uh, with, with Blockbuster. And Blockbuster at that point in time was a little bit arrogant and didn't feel as though it needed to bother with this threat called Netflix. I bet the executive who made that decision is uh, regretting it to this day. So exogenous force is the one thing that plays on that, 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 that uh, future state. What's, what's the other? Uh... Well, the other course, well, the internal forces, the forces that originate from within the organization, which are called endogenous forces. Yeah. So endogenous forces in, in, include the, the organizational capabilities that have been built up over time. So if you like, the muscles that an organization develops over time. And you know, the more that you exercise the muscles, the more those muscles get stronger, yeah? Mindset, of course, you know, we, our mindset is we do this and we only do that. That is an, an endogenous force. Leadership capability is an endogenous force. And the whole IT landscape is an endogenous force. All right, and um, endogenous forces are a result of past management decisions and actions. I like endogenous that. forces don't occur on their own; <laughs> they're a result of of things that have happened in the past. And if we go back to Blockbuster, what Blockbuster did was to build up organizational capabilities, where to put stores, what to put in stores, depending upon the demographic of the audience and things like that. Those were the capabilities they built up, right? The problem was those endogenous forces anchored them to their current trajectory. So yeah. they might have known about streaming and broadband and things like that, but they just didn't have the capabilities to do anything about it. That's fascinating, David, because, uh, you know, in, in enterprise architecture, we're all big fans of business capability based planning. But I've never thought of it's, it's a great way to think. I've never thought of those business capabilities as being muscles. They're the muscles we have to use and what I've done. And if I've built up, you know, 
big muscles in the geolocation of my video stores and the geodemographics of you know where i'm going to place these these video stores and how do i ship vhs tapes around and all, I'm, I'm i'm not a i'm sure there was lots of muscle built up right but none of those apply in the world where they're streaming yeah, and sure. they have they're what what were once um beneficial advantageous and allowed you to lead the pack now are actually inhibiting you unless you have the foresight to build up muscles that you expect to use in the future is i i don't want to jump to conclusion but that's where you're, you're absolutely right another good example of course kodak what were the muscles of Kodak? Film. Yeah. Physical film. Yeah. They actually invented the digital camera, <laughs> but they didn't know what to do with it. Another example is Xerox. Xerox at, at Xerox Park. They got fabulous capabilities in terms of, um, you know, in, in terms of the digital space. But did they knew what, know what to do with it? No, because they didn't have the muscles. They didn't have a capability to recognize what trajectory they could go on. Interesting. And I'm also, you mentioned IT landscape as well. Although it's not a business capability, I would imagine that if an organization has built, has grown, let's say, through acquisition and not been the most hygienic when it came to taking care of technical debt in their IT landscape, they might find their IT landscape constrains them. They can't change quickly enough because they have all this technical debt hanging around uh hanging around their um you know their, their neck what's your views on that in terms of you know i think i think you're absolutely right and it's not just the you know the old organizations that have got legacy applications that have been around for a long long while i, I did some work with a, a digital challenger bank uh, where i reviewed the um, the, 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 the technology strategy um and they were on their second generation platform, right? Within five years, they were in their second generation platform, but they needed to go to a third generation because they were picking the absolute wrong, not only the wrong applications, but they got completely and absolutely the wrong architecture to enable them to change their trajectory as and when they needed to. It's much more difficult, as you say, for the, the larger, you know, the, the traditional banks, that, for example, that have got such complexity that they don't touch it. Because right. if they do, they don't quite know what's going to happen about it. Um, and I think this is a serious issue for some of these um, more established or organizations, because um, the tendency is for complexity to grow. <laughs> Things don't get simple by themselves. They get complex. And, and what we've done very often is a means of expediency. It's well, we'll just put that in there. We'll just configure that this, this way and we'll get some results within this financial year. But they've created a problem for the, for the future. So I think the whole IT landscape is a very powerful endogenous force but a lot of business leaders don't understand or appreciate. I get that. And I think, David, I think one of the challenges is, uh, and I've worked with many technology organizations over my career, is for an IT organization to quantitatively uh, forecast the consequence of making a, a decision that's not the right technical one, it, although it's expedient, it might be the not technical one because then you could say well this is technical debt and the businesses will say well what's that going to cost me and the it is going to say well nothing today nothing tomorrow but in five years it's going to come back and bite you and i wonder is the problem because of the time frames that business leaders think of well five years who knows what the world's going to be like you're asking me to make a more expensive decision now for something that may or may not happen five years that you can't guarantee do you not think that's one of the problems is we can't codify we can't quantize the consequence of, of loose IT decisions, shall I say? Well, I, I think the point you make is a very important one. I, I think it's too much short-termism, right? Um, and I think that very, very often technology people have got a lot to blame in the sense they say we've got a lot of agility, we can do things, we can change things, we can whatever. It's not quite as simple as, as that. So businesses who don't quite understand it think anything can be changed, 
right? They've got this idea of this plug and play yeah. <laughs> architecture, which at a simple level does exist, of course. But I think that what, what, what I observe is that what organizations don't do, whether they be technical people or whether they be business people, is they don't think about the trajectory they're on and the default future it will bring. Yes. And I'm continually surprised when I talk to organizations about this. They say, well, we've not thought about it in that particular way. Yeah. And then I say to them, well, you know, if you're developing a strategy, then what trajectory do you want to go on? All right. What's your strategic intent, in other words? And have you assessed the influence of the exogenous forces? And have you assessed the influence of your endogenous forces? So, for again, if it comes down to IT capability, they did some work for a bank and they were replatforming. And of course, they wanted the people within the IT organization to lead the replatforming. But the reality is, they knew how to look after legacy applications that were offshore. Yeah. They didn't know anything about modern architectures and, and middleware and APIs and all that. Sort, sort of stuff so we didn't have the muscles they didn't have the capability to do it even if intellectually uh, they got it and another thing i find very often is a lot of people talk about strategy but it, it's not a strategy unless it contains strategic decisions right. and what do i mean by that a strategic decision is one when you've made that choice when you executed that choice it's difficult if not impossible to reverse or undo okay, okay. It's, it's difficult if not impossible to reverse or undo that's a true strategic decision so a strategy is only a strategy when it contains strategic decisions the rest are design planning decisions that can be changed albeit a cost so I think that, you know, you might ask me the question, well, do architects make strategic decisions? I would say definitely sometimes. Right. OK. <laughs> and what I mean by that, if architects make a lot of decisions in terms of reconfiguring stuff and making stuff work. Right. But those are not strategic decisions. Those are, if you like, I won't use the word tactical, but they're just fixing type of decisions. Yes. But they have an opportunity to influence the true strategic decisions around the architecture of a platform that will determine the trajectory of the organization for many many years to come and as a result of that its default future and, and equally i think architects have um, i think they have an accountability to understand what the exogenous forces are that a change in the context that may influence the default future in the future uh, the default future going forward does this make sense yeah i like that and i like your definition of it you know i was always struck by the use of the word architecture and its connection to real life architecture like buildings architecture and i think we use the word with purpose and oftentimes though we can hear people being loose and ready with architecture right there's a difference between architecting a building doing the interior design for a building and painting a wall and moving some chairs around yeah, right that's yeah, yeah, not yeah. all architecture yeah. and you can sure you could draw the analogy to the enterprise right reconfiguring and, and changing some database systems from oracle 10 to oracle 11 that's not architecting right that's putting a lick of paint on a wall yeah. deciding a building is going to be geothermally heated as opposed to heated via i don't know fossil fuels that's an architectural decision. That's kind of like how I think about it. I think I think you're absolutely right, and, 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 and it's, it's a good analogy with building because you know, if you go into a building and you work in that building, it's either a comfortable building to work in or a pain to work in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you can't take a hospital and turn it into an office. It was architected as a, a, an hospital, not yeah. architected as an office. Yes. And so on and so forth. And and I don't think enough business leaders understand this and it, it, you know it's understandable why because they've probably not gone through the, the, the technical route but as organizations become more and more digitally enabled i think you have to have that you know the, the digital savvy ceo and the leadership team that understand the consequences of some of the decisions 
that, that, that they make. And, and their accountability is not just to make short term uh, success, but equally to keep the organization on a trajectory that's going to lead them to a better future than their default. And as the context is continually changing, then you have to continually rethink, you have to continually reassess the trajectory you're on and say, what changes do we need to make? So I, I don't, I tend to talk, use the word trajectory more than end state. Right. Because I, I, I've never seen anybody achieve an end state. Because as you get close to the end state, you realize you need a different end state. Right, so it's, it's a trajectory, it's a vector, there is no, we, it never will end until, you know, the heat death of the universe, then we all end, right? And that, but until yeah. that time, yeah. Yeah. life, life yeah. goes on, or yeah. presumably yeah. in the case of some of those uh, companies we talked about before, like Blockbuster, the end state is, you know, in the ground, that's because yeah. of those decisions. Exactly, so I think that architecture, digital architecture, is, is, is it, those strategic decisions around that are extremely, extremely important and will become more so. As I said earlier, we can now do stuff digitally that I could only dream about 20, 30 years ago, um, you know, when, when, when we were talking about this sort of stuff. And that is great, but I'd also say as well, what's, as uh, wherever every opportunity comes a threat, we talked about it earlier on, um, now with the democratization of those technologies, with the accessibility of those technologies, barriers to entry are being reduced every yeah. single day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can get into the business a lot easier than I could because now I can just buy many of those technologies off the shelf as a service. Um, uh, and so that's why we're seeing so many new entrants coming into the marketplace, I'm sure. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Yeah. David, bring us home. What are the what are three key takeaways our audience should take from this conversation um, as it relates to, you know, the book you've written and your views on strategy? Well, I think the first one is, I think we must recognize that we live in a very uncertain, volatile world, the so-called FUCA world. And as a result of that, I think we need to think about a different approach to developing strategy, developing and executing strategy. Um, and, and I've talked about that all organizations have got a default future, which is a place they'll end up if they take no action other than currently planned. And the purpose of strategy is to change that trajectory that takes the organization to a different place. I think that's an important one. I think the second point is for we must recognize that we're on a trajectory for a reason. <laughs> yeah? It's a result of these exogenous and endogenous forces. Exogenous forces originate from outside. We can't change them. We need to understand them and we need to respond to them. And exogenous forces can open up opportunities, strategic opportunities, but it can also close them down as well. Endogenous forces originate from within the organization and they equally can do two things. Endogenous forces can anchor you to your current trajectory. And you very often don't recognize that until you try to change. But equally, if you've got the right endogenous forces in place, it can pull you onto the trajectory you want. And my experience is if you want to change trajectory, you've got to change the influence of some of those endogenous forces. Some need to be built up, and some may need to be completely uh, re re removed. And just Keeping on that a little bit more, focusing more on the sort of technology space, as we've said, one of those endogenous forces are, are, are both the IT landscape that's been developed over a period of time, but also the organizational capabilities, the capabilities around being able to design <coughs> digital landscapes, but not only change the trajectory, but I've got that degree of agility or flexibility in there so you can respond as the context continually changes. And, 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 and relating to that is, for me, is, is, if, if digital architecture really did sharpen its focus on the strategic decisions around architecture and don't let those strategic decisions get lost and all the other hundreds and thousands of decisions relating to architecture that need to be made. 
And, and one of the things I often do when we're talking about strategy or I review a strategy, I say to them, tell me what the five, three most strategic decisions are. And if they're truly strategic, remember, they're going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to reverse or undo. So right. you better get them right. And that's the asset test strategic decision. Is it is it a major one? Is it difficult to undo? Have you got to get that bet right on the tee, as they say here in the States? Absolutely. Well, David, thanks so much for a fascinating conversation. Folks, I recommend you read the book uh, by David Travis and Peter Bogus. And um, you can find that on Amazon, I'm guessing. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. There's one of our companies. So beyond default, David Trafford and Peter Bogus. What a great summary, David, and such a pleasure talking to you as well. And thank you for crystallizing the key takeaways at the end of it. And I hope to speak to you again soon. Once again, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Cheers. Bye-bye.